Welcome back to episode two of the Actuality Podcast. In our last episode, we witnessed the terrifying events surrounding the crash of Flight 757. We were introduced to Jacob Olson and saw Jacob become intrigued as he joined a new research project and was introduced to the world of memory projection and whole brain emulation. In this episode, we'll follow Jacob as he navigates this new world, grows closer to fellow students Dean and Zoe, and witnesses the power of memory projection firsthand. What will Jacob learn from this experience, and how will it shape his understanding of his own abilities? Stay tuned as we unravel these mysteries in Episode 2 of the Actuality Podcast. Jacob closed the door behind him, careful not to slam it. The echo of the loud click when it shut defeated the whole purpose of a gentle close. Professor Melbourne's office was meticulously tidy and yet a disaster at the same time. The bookshelves that lined the walls were stuffed to the absolute maximum, and anything that couldn't fit was thoughtfully placed on the floor. Pages of notes and other documents sat in stacks on the floor and on his desk. He looked up at Jacob as he came in, still typing away on his computer. Well, good morning, Jacob. I wasn't expecting to see you for a few days. Is everything okay? I was wondering if I could ask you something. Yes, of course. What do you think of the class so far, dear boy? Um, interesting for sure. I think I'll like it a lot. But I was wondering why there isn't a book for the class on special relativity. You know, something on whole brain emulation or faster than uh, uh, FTL or, or something. There's so much to know. Well, yes, you're right. Most classes have workbooks and textbooks set up as a form of assistance for the students, but our class is an exception. Most of our materials are online, so you can access them whenever you'd like, from home or in class. However, there are lots of things you won't be familiar with. Jacob pulled back the chair and sat down, focusing on the professor's face. The special relativity class was authorized to begin in the summer of 2007. My partner, who has regrettably moved on to different projects since then, and I received funding from the Tobar Zandrich Foundation. The funding kept us going for over five years. The project was progressing nicely. We discovered the simplest way to access the brain's temporal lobe and successfully gained the ability to project memories right from the brain, even to different facilities, as we demonstrated to those who continued to fund the project. We ran into several roadblocks, and as our progress stalled, uh, my partner admitted beginning to feel that our research was useless. He was right in one way. His major complaint was that even though we could project memories from building to building, that the distance between facilities proved nothing. It was true, the distance necessary for any sort of teleportation exceeded our tests by light years. Uh, he kept working, but it was obvious that he cared less and less for our research as time went on. During the preparations for our next major experiment, miscalculations were made for the energy output needed to complete a short projection. Who was at fault is still up for debate, though I was sure that I checked my calculations multiple times. Anyhow, at the time, we were using a student as a subject. He had very limited control of his thoughts after reaching REM sleep, as we later discovered. We'd used too much force and overwhelmed the temporal lobe. The poor boy began to experience terrible bouts with hallucinations. It was all beneficial in one sense, though. We knew then that the projections from the lobe caused the capacity of the mind to weaken, with a side effect being that the subject was prone to adverse effects. This was a cause of great concern. Energy expenditures to execute projections to black holes light years away would be substantially greater than what was used. Though we knew where we had gone wrong, the research was deemed too dangerous and our funding was immediately pooled the university was forced to shut the program down. I wasn't ready to give up on the fundamental basis of our research, and soon I discovered precisely what we needed to complete it. Someone who had full control of their mind whilst in the dream state, REM sleep, which, of course, is you. Oh, so is that how I ended up in that cool dorm and not in freshman housing? The professor rocked back in his chair with his arms folded and smiled. He didn't answer Jacob's question directly. But his smile said a lot. You have an incredible mind, Jacob. Your control numbers topped any that I'd ever seen. We need you here. With your control, we can send you back into the oldest memories. Think of that. You could go back and interact with your past. You could take our research to new levels. 
Jacob was unsure whether the professor was pleading for his help or if his story was meant to build his confidence in the class. What happened to your partner? After the university banned further research on the premises, my partner decided that it would be best for him to move on. As of now, I'm unsure whether he's continued his own research or given it up completely. But that, my dear boy, is how the story goes. So that's why the class is so late. He knew he was taking on a big secret, but felt relieved to have answers to the questions that had been bothering him. Yes, and while we are technically not even permitted to meet on campus, holding the class at night makes it possible to continue. The brain emulation equipment is one of a kind, and with our time constraints, we have no other options. What's the big hurry? Why don't you just get everything perfect and get the funding back yourself? Before the professor could respond, Jacob continued. And why on earth would your partner just quit? You were so close. That doesn't make any sense to me. The professor let out a heartfelt laugh and swiveled <laughs> in his chair, looking out the window behind him. Simply put, time. We spent so much time looking for someone like you that we didn't think there would be enough time to perfect the process. Every 125 years, the Dabravan phenomenon takes place. The what? What's that? Adam Dabravan was a brilliant researcher in the area of time travel in his day. Relying on the information his father passed down to him, he was able to discover a series of black holes that became operative every 125 years. He attributed this to the alignment of Uranus, Jupiter, and Mercury. The last time the black holes were operable was 1889, several years before his death. As brilliant as he was, Dabravan was limited by the tools of his time. He discovered a 30-day window between the appearance of the holes and the time they would close again. I can only imagine how frustrating it would be to have the key to time travel in front of you, only to be hampered by primitive equipment. My partner and I were planning to perfect the research before the next Dabravan occurrence. Professor Melbourne turned back to Jacob, handing him a small timer. We have exactly 120 days and 21 hours until the black holes close yet again. Jacob stood in silence, staring at the timer counting down each passing second. <sighs> you keep that. It will remind you of the urgency of our project. <laughs> and hopefully it will remind you to be on time for class. Jacob couldn't help but grin. This is wild. He was so excited that he was left speechless. Jacob leaned forward and pressed the palms of his hands into Melbourne's desk as he stood. Dabervan, faster than light travel, black holes, it was all new to him. The project would allow him to do something incredible and help the professor with something he thought was well worth the effort. The risk and the urgency of the project made it that much more exciting. Hmm. One more question. You said it was possible to interact with the past. If a person was able to get their memories to one of the black holes, you know, with the whole projection time travel process, what if they were able to change a memory? You know, change their past. What would happen? Ah, good question. Theoretically, any changes that come into play because of something altered in the past would cause instantaneous and permanent effects. Not being able to actually test the theory, there are many questions that are just unanswerable. So, if something was changed in the past, it would change the future? Professor Melbourne scratched his chin as he looked at Jacob. Still, theoretically speaking, if someone went into the past and made a change that caused them to learn how to swim, for example, when they didn't previously know how, that change would happen instantly from that moment and affect the future. But the answer isn't that simple. Maybe we can discuss it more another time. Jacob pondered the professor's explanation, then lifted his palms from the desk. This is too much. I think this is going to be really cool, though, and I can't wait to get to work. He looked down at the timer he'd been given, then back at the professor in time to see him nod. He turned to make his way out of the office, excited to think about what he might soon be able to do. So, we analyze ways that time is measured and study the many mechanical timekeeping devices that exist. That would be horology. It's quite interesting, but perhaps not your thing, huh? Zoe looked at Jacob, her face bright. His earlier conclusion that she was truly passionate about the subject had been correct. Not only did Zoe love horology, she was incredibly good at anything related to time. Uh, honestly, not really, but I could probably learn to like it, though. He turned his head and looked at her again, her warm smile mesmerizing. Jacob's eyes became glued to the sight of Zoe. 
He was conscious of his sudden attraction to her, but he couldn't peel his eyes away no matter how hard he tried. Zoe's lips moved as she asked him a question, and though he felt himself respond with a nod, he hadn't the slightest clue of what she actually said. Her lips then spread with another one of her bright smiles, and she turned to reach for some papers on the table behind her. The movement seemed to be slower than reality. Jacob took in every moment, noticing that she moved so gracefully, and as her body turned, he took in the scent of her sweet perfume. When Zoe finally seemed to turn back to him, she scanned the paper she held for some snippet of information. Her lips were pressed together in concentration, and Jacob saw how soft they looked. He wondered for a moment what it would be like to kiss them. And that's the thought that seemed to bring him back to reality. It seemed so strange and out of character that Jacob instantly sobered. And as he did so, Zoe turned the papers for Jacob to see and pointed at the line that she'd wanted to show him. Here. Here's a list of some of them. She handed a page to Jacob. Jacob stared at her for a moment longer before his eyes moved to the paper. Even before he looked at the written words, he caught himself staring at her small hands. He almost had to physically shake himself out of the daze, but he was glad that he didn't have to. He would have hated to do something so embarrassing in front of her. After a second, he turned his focus to the words she pointed to. It was a list of some simple timekeeping methods. It listed clocks, watches, timers, sundials, automatic clocks, time recorders, and it went on. But he got the point. <laughs> well, now I feel stupid. That should have been obvious. Ugh. Zoe giggled in return. <laughs> no, don't worry about it. It's actually a pretty common misconception. Jacob looked at her once more, feeling doubtful of his sudden attraction to her. She was much too pretty, and he was, well, there was no way she'd be into him, he thought. Dean finally showed up, walking up to Jacob from behind. Hey, you two. Having a party without me? <laughs> yeah, you missed it. It just ended. Uh, again? You know what? You're no longer in charge of the parties. You always leave me out. <laughs> then they both started laughing, and as Jacob wasn't exactly sure how to respond, he felt himself only contributing a quiet chuckle. Jacob zoned out from the rest of their conversation, not that he wasn't interested. He was just mentally feeling a bit out of it, and opted to continue quietly writing his observations onto a sheet of paper that he'd been working on with Zoe. Jacob, how about you give the machine a shot this time? Melbourne suggested as the team crowded around the projection machine preparing to observe the night's experiment. Today, the entire class was there, making a grand total of 22 students, a much larger crowd than there had been several days ago. Sure, I guess, Jacob said. He moved through the crowd of students and sat down in the big seat. Melbourne turned after a minute from the computer to help him adjust the head strap that connected to the machine's helmet. Just go wherever your mind takes you. Jacob nodded, but he couldn't see the faces of those confused by Melbourne's remark as the helmet lowered over his head and the chair reclined. He listened to the other students' chatter while they waited for him to fade off to sleep. Though their words were somewhat muffled by the helmet, and he rarely understood what was actually being spoken. We have yet to look into a lot of the technicalities behind REM. It's something we will do soon. Another thing to note, though, is that your brain's neurons during REM are quite similar to those while you're awake. This makes it so your dreams are more memorable and much more vivid than those during non-REM sleep. It's partially why we can get such excellent footage of the dreams during our experiments. It took Jacob a long time to finally reach REM sleep. He struggled to sleep over the class's chatter, but soon his exhaustion overwhelmed him. Even so, Jacob's memory took much longer to start displaying on the screen than Martha's had. Similar to Martha's projection, though, the screen became filled with another color, though for Jacob's dream it was an ugly grayish brown. There was motion seen in the projection before the color had spread across the entire screen. It was clear that it was Jacob in the middle of the screen as Martha had been, and the brown color darkened around Jacob's person to form the moving shape of him and his surroundings. The colors panned out, revealing that there was not much that the grayish-brown had been concealing. Jacob appeared to be inside a building, trudging up a staircase of old, crumbling, grayish-white stone. The stairs spiraled both ahead and behind him, winding up and around a post that never seemed to end. He kept moving forward, finding more stairs that never seemed to end and always led to nowhere. The projection went on like that until it faded out almost an hour later. Jacob woke up fumbling in his exhaustion as he tried to pull off the helmet. His eyes were squinting, even after he had taken himself out of the chair, not too impressed about the bright light that seemed to have helped him wake up. 
Jacob stood next to the platform that held the chair, resting his arm against it while he underwent the process of fully waking up. <sighs> What's with the bright light? It's a dawn simulator, meant to wake the person inside the machine naturally by means of sunlight rather than disruption. A student that Jacob didn't know yet chimed in before Melbourne got the chance to respond. Yes, that's exactly what it is. When a person inside the machine wakes up unnaturally during a projection, it can cause serious consequences to their body or can even be fatal. A dawn simulator ensures that there is no risk at all involved in waking the person inside the machine sooner than their body would naturally awaken. Oh, I get it. Let's take a quick look over the recording and review it before wrapping up for today. Melbourne said, working on the computer to pull the footage of Jacob's projection back onto the screen. They all watched for a few moments in silence before anyone decided to speak up. The linear projection could suggest high concentration on a certain subject or worry. See how Jacob doesn't seem to change at all, just like the rest of the scene? One student offered. Right. He looks like someone who has his mind set on one thing, with no intention of changing his focus. Zoe said, looking to Jacob briefly and offering him a smile. Well, you see, as the temporal lobe is accessed, there is a natural drop in brain strength. You'll notice with Jacob, though, there is no drop in his mental capacity as the projections begin. It's quite remarkable, Professor Melbourne highlighted. The students looked to Jacob in awe, but most of them were curious as to what that actually meant. Jacob sat studying in the library the next day. He had several different classes to complete work for. After a while, he grew ridiculously bored so he picked up all of the books from the table and slid them into his backpack. As he made his way out of the library, he felt someone's arms wrap around his neck. Panic seeped through him, and he struggled against them. What's up, man? It was Dean who had jokingly decided to put Jacob in a headlock. Jacob pulled free from Dean's grip and stopped beside him, but adrenaline still pumped through him even after he knew there was nothing to worry about. Now he felt like an idiot, all worked up. And as a bonus, his heart wouldn't stop racing. <sighs> Hey, man. What's up? Oh, nothing much. Except with you and Zoe. I mean, it's pretty obvious you're into her. Last night, you were stumbling all over your words and staring no, at me. No, I... Don't even try it, dude. I know what's what. You should totally ask her out. Jacob was silent for a moment, not sure what to make of the question. He couldn't tell if Dean was serious or making fun of him. But he decided to give Dean the benefit of the doubt and believe he was serious. Uh, no, I can't. She's out of my league. There's just no way. If I ask her out, she'll laugh in my face. And then what? You don't really think she's that kind of girl, do you? Well, no, but she's way too pretty. Why would she even bother? Well, then that settles it. You're both the perfect definition of nerd, so I'll ask her out for you. Either way, I couldn't stand to see you drooling all over yourself for the entire class again. <laughs> my goodness. This time, Jacob knew he was making fun of him. And though Jacob grinned from excitement and embarrassment, he thought that Dean was probably right. I can see you two traveling the world like the two super geeks you both are. But, you know, much cooler. Maybe somewhere in South France. One of those palatial French mansions or something. I bet she's really into you, though. In fact, I know she is, bro. You gotta go for it. The thought was appealing to Jacob. But he couldn't find a way to express that. For fear of Dean making fun of him again. I suppose, Jacob said thinking about how he hoped Dean actually made good on that offer to ask Zoe out for him. Hey, don't forget about the big game tonight. Be at my place by 6 o'clock, okay? Dean said, and Jacob waved as he ran off. The lab was busy with lots of students preparing for the night's experiment. After some basic preparations were made, everyone gathered around the projection machine. Several students spoke loudly about things that Jacob didn't much care about. He struggled to block them out, and their voices moved in and out of his direct attention. Jacob, I'd like to use you as our subject again today. The way the professor spoke gave Jacob the impression that he wasn't just suggesting Jacob participate, but rather that he really wanted him to. Okay. Jacob began moving through the crowd of students and toward the machine. While he prepped the helmet and strapped himself in, Professor Melbourne started speaking again. See if you can return to the same memory as last session, Melbourne suggested offhandedly. Though he had only mentioned it to Jacob, several other students heard his request and immediately after, whispers could be heard throughout the room, all of them wondering what Melbourne was planning. What does he mean he wants Jacob to return to the last memory? You got me. 
I was always under the impression that where you end up was all by chance. I guess we'll see, Dean mumbled, and the rest of the class's whispering died as Jacob prepared to fall into a deep sleep. The screen flickered to life with the same motion that was always viewed when the subject entered REM sleep, and as they had seen last time, Jacob was in the projection machine. When the projection began to display signs of motion, the professor opened the last recording of Jacob's and played it alongside the live version of it. The class watched as Jacob repeated the same projection of him walking up the endless spiral staircase. Both of the screens looked identical, nothing having changed from the recording to the current projection. The replication continued on for several minutes before some of the students began to ask what was going on. How was he able to do that? Zoe heard one of the students mumble behind her. Then the live feed completely changed. Jacob turned back to face the students while the previous recording continued going on with Jacob walking up the winding stairs. On the screen where Jacob had stopped, he started waving to everyone. All of the students broke out in a low murmur of mixed excitement wow. and confusion. How can he do that? Zoe said. Jacob grinned and turned away from them again, only to do a backflip down the stairs. As his feet hit the stone floor of the tower stairs, he came upon a door and opened it. He walked through it, finding himself on the street surrounded by buildings with 18th century architecture. He walked over the edge of the street to the waterway. Jacob knelt to reach into the water and splashed a cupped handful directly in front of him, imagining that it would appear to the class as though the water was headed directly for them. He grinned and walked over to a young woman sitting on a bench. He looked over at the class, then back at the young woman, before kissing her. The woman promptly smacked Jacob, causing the class to laugh mostly because they all thought it was incredible how he had such control over the projection that he could be aware of his surroundings and do things like throw water and interact with people in the memory. All things that none of them had ever seen any other student do before. Jacob figured he would show one last bit of control and hopefully redeem himself from the embarrassment dished out to him with the smack to the face. He walked over to a stand and purchased a dessert, then took the dessert back to the woman who'd previously smacked him and mashed it in her face. The memory projection didn't last much longer and eventually began to fade away. In fact, everyone was disappointed that it ended. Jacob woke up to a round of applause when he stepped back onto the floor from the platform. Everyone was impressed with what Jacob had achieved, even Professor Melbourne. And not more than a few of them thought what he'd done had been impossible. Dude, Jacob, what was that? I guess the reason I'm here? Jacob shrugged trying to play it off as if not meaning much. That was far from the truth, though. The opportunity to work with Melbourne and the others meant everything to him. Now, everyone, it's time to talk a bit about what we all just observed. Our newest team member, Jacob, comes to us with a hard-earned ability that can put the legitimacy of our research to the test. Memory projection simply accesses and projects the live images within the brain. What you have just witnessed was skillful manipulation of the cortex what you all should be familiar with as lucid dreaming. Jacob's immaculate skill gives him the ability to become lucid in his dream state and allows complete control over the dream world. Only 3% of the world's population can control their dreams in this fashion, and less than 1% can maintain that measure of control necessary to influence the dream as if they were awake. As Jacob has demonstrated, he can do whatever he can think of inside his memories, within the realm of human possibility. Not a dream but reliving actual events in his mind and manipulating the outcomes. If you don't mind, Jacob, tell us where you were. Where did you take us to? <laughs> well, when I was a kid, my family took a trip to Belgium. I always wanted to kiss that lady. Ah, I thought something was familiar about that scene. That is awesome, Dean said, bringing his hand up to get a high five from Jacob. Jacob's response wasn't so pathetic this time and he met Dean's outstretched hand with an enthusiastic whack. Everyone else follows suit and overwhelmed Jacob with more high fives, attention, and praise. Let's take a look at these charts. Professor Melbourne pulled out the recorded charts of Jacob's brain activity during REM sleep and compared them to someone who could not lucid dream. As it clearly displayed on the charts, Jacob's activity during sleep remained in his average zone, while the other person's activity dipped several whole levels. Professor Melbourne backed away from the class, having given them enough to talk about for the night, allowing them the opportunity to discuss Jacob's skills on their own. He watched all of the students while they spoke with Jacob, and he was happy that such an incredible student was getting the attention he deserved, even if it was just by his peers. The professor had known that Jacob was capable of doing all of this, 
and that he was most certainly capable of more. But he wondered just how much more. That's a wrap on this episode of the Actuality Podcast. Today we've journeyed deeper into Jacob's abilities and seen them evolve. But what does this mean for the future of the Memory Projection Project? And now that he knows that there is only limited time to make the project successful, what hurdles will he and the others have to overcome to ensure success? As we leave Jacob in the midst of college life, friendships, and scientific breakthroughs, we're left on the edge of our seats. What will the Dabervan phenomenon bring? How will Jacob's relationship with Zoe unfold? Stay tuned for the next episode of the Actuality Podcast, and don't forget to like and subscribe.